All right. If you know what's good for you, you'll pop some popcorn, and you will get some M and M's, and they can be plain or peanut. And you're gonna dip it in the popcorn. Yes, you're gonna dip it right into the popcorn, and you're gonna eat this mess of chocolate, peanuts, and popcorn while you sit back and listen to Joe and Sonny give the interview that you've never seen before. You've never seen an interview like this ever. I promise you. You'll be you know, the salt and the sweet will just mix in your mouth as like this cornucopia of awesome. And then you'll go, and the interview's awesome. The popcorn is awesome. This is so awesome. <laughs> no way. You've lived long enough. Actually, it's been too long for my taste. Frieza, listen up. We quit. All of us. Got it? We don't work for you. We're free! You can find someone else to do your dirty work! Oh yeah! There is one last thing. This is for all the people that we killed in your name! I wish we were never foolish enough to obey you! Here! Have it! You, my son. You are the one who will defeat Frieza. I'll take on all four of those goons at once. Just like Yamcha was going to do. Attack. What the? Let's go, Chatsu! I'm not sure what he's planning to do, but I know this much. We don't want to be here when the blast hits! It's lunchtime, everybody. Excuse me while I pop over to China for a quick bite. <laughs> Hello there. I'm back. Okay. Hi, sir. So what... what's with the missile? A souvenir from a strike force that tried to bring me down over the Sea of Japan. Must be lonely spending your life in the crosshairs. Quite the opposite, actually. Reminds me of how amazing I am. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, my name is Joe. Also known as Jay-Z Crux on YouTube, I am amazingly, wonderfully talented guest today. What is your name, sir? My name is Sonny Strait. How are you guys doing? Welcome, Mr. Strait. I got a couple of questions for you, if you don't mind. Okay, cool. So, uh, what are you doing during these times of quarantine? Well, right now I've been spending most of my time reformatting my entire career so it can be online. You know, uh, I for the longest time, nobody was doing anything, like almost four months. And I, I'm a comic book artist and a, and a voice actor and a teacher. And um, all of a sudden, all of those things had to be done at home. Now, the comic book stuff, that was a pretty easy transition to make because I was already drawing at home and sending it in uh, through the Internet. But uh, there was this long period where nobody was doing anything in the comic book industry. So that was put on hold. And then about the time, and I was holding off on my teaching too, because I usually taught in person at my own studio. But for a long time, you know, we, we couldn't, we still can't, you know, be around people safely. So I held off as long as I could. And I finally, around in June, I said, well, all these people had ordered this class in April. Um, I better do something. So I decided to see if I could do it online and switch to Zoom classes. 
And I was really nervous about that, too, because it was like, um, are they going to still get, you know, the same information? Are they going to get as much out of the class? But what it seems to be is they're actually getting more out of the class. Um, I think it's because most people are, you know, shy people, right? Mm -hmm. And to uh, be in front of a live group of people, like it's usually my class is about 20 people. Mm -hmm. And trying to perform in front of 20 people in person is a lot harder than to do it at home. So what I'm finding is they're a lot more comfortable in the classroom setting, you know, when they're online. But they, them, so I, was, so I was trying to change that over online. And then at the same week, it was the same week I started drawing comics again. I started teaching again. And then Funimation sent me a, a home recording uh, set. So right. I'm now recording at home. And it's all great, but it's like it all happened at the same time. So it's like my entire career now has to be reformatted to be inside this little box here. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. Well, I think you're very talented, by the way, Mr. Spirit. Thank you very much. That's very nice. Oh, what made you want to become a voice actor? And who was your biggest inspiration for voice acting? <sighs> Probably my inspiration for voice acting is Mel Blanc. He's the guy that, that created the voice for Bugs Bunny and Porky Pig and Daffy Duck mm -hmm. and all those guys. And that's when I was a kid growing up. And I also remember when I was a kid, uh, the Hanna-Barbera cartoons, mm -hmm. uh, like Racers and uh, the Perils of Penelope Pit Stop and things like that. Mm -hmm. And... I used to love those old cartoons, Underdog. Oh. Uh, and then I was, it was so funny because about five, maybe 10 years ago, I was thinking about, I love the career I'm in, but I thought, oh, I never got to do cartoons like I wanted to do, like Underdog, right? Mm -hmm. And then I watched some Underdog on YouTube. That is yeah. the stupidest cartoon I've ever seen in my life. I was like, thank mm -hmm. God for anime that I actually get to do something interesting instead of stupid Underdog. And I still get to do the funny voices. I mean, I'm kind of known for it, you know. Mm. So uh, it was, uh, I, I got to, I, it's funny because a lot of times people don't realize they've achieved their dreams when they've done it, you know. Mm. And, and no, your dreams aren't going to happen the way you think they're going to happen. You know, even if you, because that dream no longer exists, right. You know, if you, if you dream about, oh, I wish I could have been like on a Hanna-Barbera you know, cartoon voice actor, well, those don't exist anymore, right? It, yeah. It's a new format. And if you look around, you might realize that, oh, actually, this is much better, you know? Yeah. But that was my biggest inspiration. I used to do cartoon voices. All, my dad, I guess you have to say my dad is my biggest inspiration. He used to do funny voices for fun. Like, he did uh, Donald Duck, and he taught me how to do that when I was four. And so my first impression was like, hello, how are you? You know, and uh, once he did that, he was like, oh, and I'll do uh, Mickey Mouse and all these other things. You know, he could do tons of voices. But when I got into high school, I took it uh, acting more seriously. And I was thinking, oh, I'm going to be a theater professor because that what else do you do? If you're a really good actor in high school, uh, then you go to college and you get you become a professor and teach. That was that seemed to be the most logical thing for me to do because I lived in Texas. There's no. There's no cartoon studios in Texas back in 1970, whatever it was. And um, so that was my goal. And then I got into college and I was uh, a theater major and I was getting all the leads in theater and everything. And I was seeing like, this is my path, right? And then I met this guy who was drawing his own comic book series. And it, it was so cool. And I thought, oh, I love this. And I drew for the cart I drew cartoons for my school newspapers, right? So I thought, well, I'm going to throw this guy some fan art. And I did. And he said, oh, dude, you need to draw the comic. And I was like, well, I never drew a comic book before, but I'll try it. So he and I would do these little 10-page mini comics and hand them out over Denton, Texas. And we kind of became like local celebrities. We were, The comic book was called The Sex Gophers from Hell. I don't know if you can say that on your channel. That's uh, fine. Bleep it out if you can. Okay. <laughs> but it was about a rock band called The Sex Gophers. And... Um, after a while, we kind of we got known as the sex gopher guys, and we'd be invited to parties. People would ask us to draw on their walls and stuff, you know, probably rent houses, so the landlords probably weren't too happy seeing our artwork everywhere. But it was it was a pretty cool experience. People would buy us drinks at bars and stuff like, you're the sex gopher guys, oh my God, let me get you drinks. So we're like, we got a taste of fame from it. And then I was still going to college, and then uh, we got a story published. It was uh, called The Atomic Punk. And it was a 10-page story published in an anthology. 
And once I got published, I just dropped out of school. And I said, you know what? I want to focus on this. So I gave up acting altogether. But anyway, so I, we got published. And I said, okay, forget school. I dropped out of school. Ten years I focused on We had We self-published for a while. We had other smaller published pictures up. And then I started getting the acting bug again and started doing theater in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And I was also teaching uh, theater at a local community theater. I taught uh, kindergarten through 12th grade acting classes. But um, I wasn't taking it too seriously. It was more just for fun, right? Because mm -hmm. I wanted to be a cartoonist. And then Funimation moved to Texas and um, had open auditions for Dragon Ball Z. And I got the part of Krillin. But when I got the part of Krillin, you know, Krillin dies quite a bit. So it was kind of a part-time job. So I still couldn't take that seriously. I was doing, mostly I was paying my bills by doing commercial art. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also was a portrait and caricature artist. And then um, uh, Cartoon Network really liked what I did with, with Krillin and asked me to audition for Toonami Tom. And I got the first, I was the first Tsunami Tom for Cartoon Network. And that was, um, when I got that, I realized I kind of stumbled onto a career. So I started taking it more seriously. Nice. I like that. Believe it or not, that's why, like, for a career, I would become, like, a, like an artist, like a comic book artist, or, like, a writer. I love writing. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's the thing. Um, I think most of the people I know at Funimation are good at more than just one thing, you know? Because mm -hmm. I think creativity is the same it's just how you want to apply it. Like if you really grok with acting or, or cartooning or whatever, if you it's the creativity that will translate. You just got to figure out how to do it in that form. You know, like most of the function actors are at least musicians on the side. You know, uh, uh, yeah. And uh, I know Chris Savitt was an opera singer. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> it's not that surprising. Uh, Micah Solisad. Um, Soul and Soul Eater. He's a, a, a incredible cartoonist as well. He's a great manga artist. Matter of fact, he had drawn one manga page and put it in his deviant art, and I was following his deviant art. That's all he did. So I started a campaign where I went around to conventions saying how lazy uh, Michael Solisad is. He's just a lazy, shiftless bastard. He won't. He, he's like got all this talent. He won't use it and stuff. Anyway, he started drawing. Comic, he said, I want you to know it got back to me what you were doing, and I want you to know I've actually started my own comic book series. And he's still drawing it today. Started, I think he started that like five years ago. So uh, I, I I definitely love, and I love all the arts, really. Anything that's artistic, I kind of gravitate to, and I always want to be a part of it, even if I'm not very good at it. Like I was in a band. I should not be in a band, but I've been in at least two, no three now. <laughs> so the sex go for some. Gophers band. We actually wrote a song. Uh, it's a, it's a, let's go for a song. I can't even repeat it. You're probably too young. Anyway, so it's a good song though. <laughs> oh man, uh, what was your favorite role that you portrayed? And what, can you please do the voice of that one? I guess my favorite role, Sensei. Uh, he's assassination classroom. He's got these squid arms, and he goes. <laughs> And his voice is like mine. It's just a little bit more smarmy. It's up in this area. You know, it's like if, if I've had a lot of coffee, that's me. Hey, kids, how are you? So he's uh, he's definitely my favorite. I would say next would have to be Krillin or Usopp. They're kind of tied. And they kind of sound the, the same. There's a, there's a little slight difference. Uh, Krillin talks like this, right? And I can do that all day. But Usopp talks like that with a hitch in his voice? And that hitch, uh, it hurts. I need a cough drop just from doing that. Where are my right. cough drops? Yeah. Uh, somewhere. <clears throat> Can you do a uh, Barduck if you want? No. It's too <laughs> hard. Frieza, we don't work for you anymore. Got it? A lot of shouting for him. A little less shouting, though, in the movie, the last movie we did. He, he was actually a kinder, gentler Bardock. But still Bardock. He's still a B.A. I like that. I like your roles. You're so you're so talented, Mr. Straight. Like I like them. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate oh. it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, if you could pick any role in any TV show, movie, etc., what role would you love to portray? But obviously, obviously, you didn't. But you wish you did. Um, probably Popeye. Popeye. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's my favorite character of everything. Uh, I just love his design. I love those big arms, those big forearms. 
and I love his voice. And actually, when um, when I first got cast as Krillin, uh, the I supposed to sound like the Canadian version. It sounded like this, eh? You know, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, I got cast because I could sound the most like the the Canadian because the Canadians got it first, and then Funimation moved from Canada down to um, Texas. So, but once I got the role, I started reading the comic books, uh, the, the manga. And the voice in my head when I read the manga didn't sound like that at all. It sounded more like, like, like Popeye, but on helium. You know, hey, how's it going, you know? And so the first day I was recording, I was doing a uh, scene like this. Come on, wait up, you guys. Ah! And uh, the director said, I sound just like the original voice, of, uh, the Canadian voice, but he can't stand that voice. And I was like... Uh oh, this is my first role, right? I thought he was going to recast me. I was like, oh, dude, I do other voices. And he goes, yeah, I know. I remember. Hey, this guy's a big old Texas guy. He's like, I remember. I remember him from, uh, from your auditions. You did all kinds of crazy voices. And and so I said, well, what about, like, because this is the voice I heard in my head when I read the comics. I said, what about, like, Popeye on Helium? And he goes, well, what would that sound like? I, said, I don't know, something like this. Come on, guys, let's go. And he went, yeah, you said that. That's good. Yeah. So. Uh, I got to change it right away, which was good because I would have hated trying to do somebody else's interpretation of a character for the whole time. And um, so, but Popeye, yeah, would definitely be the character I'd want to voice, you know, just because I just love Popeye. And uh, I would just love to be doing, doing all the scat singing. Like, mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, yeah, I guess that's the one I would choose. Okay. Yeah. It's a good choice, Popeye. Good choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. nice. <laughs> and then, if you don't mind, since you did your Krillin, can you say, like, Destructo Disc? Like, you know, if he does that. No. <laughs> All right. Destructo Disc! There you go. Thank you. That's, that's a hard one to do. Uh, yep. he, you know, he's uh, he screams quite a bit, right? But it's yep. not like Usopp. Usopp screams even in conversation. You can't have a conversation... Like, if you're talking to Krillin, he can talk to you on this level, right? Usopp would be like, hey, how's it going? Oh, it's good to see you. Everything's right here. It's like, stop. Yeah. Stop yelling, Usopp. Why are you yelling? Yeah. I think I think that um, Oda just likes people screaming because all of our characters in One Piece scream everything. Well, of course, if you're used to working on a ship, and you're especially a ship that flies, you're going to mm -hmm. be used to screaming because you have to yell to be heard. Yeah. So maybe that's the justification there. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the voices. Okay. You're welcome, man. Over the years of your career, do you still keep in touch with the co-stars, directors, etc.? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although we don't, you know, we don't usually get to see each other except at conventions. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, except our, our if they're directing, because most of the voice actors have become directors at one point or another, you know. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, when we did uh, Dragon Ball Z Kai, Chris let a lot of us who were directing at that point direct ourselves. So I was that was I actually got to direct Krillin. So I got to direct myself as Krillin, which is cool because I got to do him exactly the way I wanted to do him. And I think I mean, we had already had a pretty good hold of the character by then because we'd already done the whole Dragon Ball Z series. But after Kai, I knew this guy inside and out. I had no problem improvising with him or whatever, you know. Like I I remember one time in um, Dragon Ball Super. Okay. Krillin just defeats the guy that defeats Android 18, right? Mm -hmm. And he, I look at the flaps on the screen and I went, I told Raleigh, the director, I said, hang on, I, I got a line for this one. I want to change what's in the script. He goes, yeah? And I said, yeah. So I saw the flaps and I knew the mouth flaps worked perfectly for this. So I went, oh man, I am totally Krillin it today. And then he gets hit. Wham! And uh, it was like, it was great. Because I, I don't think I would have been as comfortable before Kai doing something like that. But in that moment, I was like, Oh yeah, Krillin could say this and get away with it. Yeah. Do, do you yeah. have a favorite saga from Dragon Ball Z? Like a uh, you know the Boo saga, the Android saga. Uh, yeah. It's probably the Android saga because it was in the Android saga I really started to know who this guy was, and there was it was still early on, but it was a scene where he's got the device that can shut down the androids. Mm -hmm. you know, that, yeah. the, the big red button push here, and uh, I was like, uh, there was a scene. Where he's all because he's already been kissed on the cheek by her, so you know he's in love with her, and he's stressing out over this, and he's got paragraphs to speak, but they're not matching mouth flaps. It's all in his head. 
So I didn't have to try to force the acting to fit the mouth flaps. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was able just to act, you know, like I had been doing for 14 years before I started working at Funimation. And then I was like, oh, I know who this guy is. He's a sucker for love. I get it. All mm -hmm. right. And from that on, then on, I took, I played him that way. Like his whole motivation is he just wants to have somebody to love, you know? That's, that's a good song too. And he said somebody. <laughs> somebody to love. Who is the coolest person you've worked with? Coolest person? I think the king of cool at Funimation would have to be Chris Sabat. Chris Sabat, okay. Yeah. I mean, and I mean like classic cool too. Like, I mean, not even hippie cool. We're going back to like beatnik stuff. He's like, he calls everybody brother, you know, and um, he say this cat does this, this cat does that, you know. It's like, and and he got all of us like I remember in the old days we all started calling each other brother, you know, right. because of Chris Sabat, you know. He just did it so much. Hey, brother, I just want to know if you can uh, do that. And we're like, yeah, brother, we can do it, brother. You know, everybody's brother, brother, brother. Hey, you cats, you can take care of it. It's like, and he had he always had very interesting like uh, facial hair. Like, he had trimmed his beards in crazy ways all the time. And he just, it just seemed to work with him. Um, and he was the coolest guy under pressure of anyone I've ever met, you know. So, yeah, I would definitely say the king of cool is definitely Chris Sabat. And also, he has the coolest character. He plays Vegeta. There's no cooler character than Vegeta. Although he does, he can't keep his cool, but he's such a cool character. What director taught you the most? And which director would you love to work with? Oh, man, Chris is going to get big head because it's Chris again on that one. Um, when uh, I first started directing, we'd only had two directors, I think, at that point. Uh, and I think Mike McFarlane had just started a month or two before. Oh, Master Uchi. <laughs> yeah. But I started directing uh, Lupin the Third. We had, like, a series of nine movies that we directed. And the first one, Chris directed, but um, I played Lupin. And he said, man, you just... You know, you've got such a hold on this character. Um, I think you could probably direct it. Have you ever directed before? And I said, well, I've never directed animation, but I've directed uh, plays, you know, many times because I've been doing theater for 14 years. And he mm -hmm. said, well, I think you could do it. He said, but here's the thing. Just here's my, my only tip. He said, really listen to what the actors are giving you. It might not be what's in your head, but if it works for the scene just as well, go with the actors. He said, there's many reasons for that. One, um, actors have very fragile egos, right? So mm -hmm. if you keep turning down their choices, then they don't, they don't produce as well. They don't give you as much creativity, right? Mm -hmm. But also, what's in your head tends to be a cliche, something that we've all heard read that way before. But if you hear a different reading that you've never heard that's not in your head but works for the scene, then you've got an interesting read and people's ears are going to perk up when they hear it. And that was incredible advice. And I, I do that to this day. You know, every time I'm directing, I listen to what the, the actor is giving me. If it works for the scene, but may not be what's in my head, I just go with them every time. And they feel very free that way too. And I get some of the best readings I think of anybody. Huh. I like that. Is there a director you like to work with? Um, yeah, there's quite a few directors like to work with i generally like to work with directors who are actors you know especially really good actors um because they they tend to get out of your way you know they don't try to to uh uh there's some, sometimes you can work with the directors that they want to tell you no say it like this right sometimes when i go in i would just say if i've worked with them before i'll just say how do you want me to say it you know just to get it over with but generally that's that's a rarity most of the time us are Especially at Funimation, it's a rarity. But um, most of the time, people I work with are actors, and they understand the craft of acting, and that they have to get out of your way, you know. Yeah. And that you're there yeah, as a director. I'm. I feel like, uh, as a director, I'm there when you can't get there, you know, on mm -hmm. your own. If you can't get there on your own, I will try to get you there, and I won't try to get you there by telling you how to say it. We call that a line read. If I give you a line read, I always take five points off my grade. I'm like, okay, you made a 95. If you, you had to give him a line read on that one, you failed. Because you should be able to communicate with a, a, an actor how to say a line by not without telling them how to say it, without actually doing it for them. You know, you need to explain to them what's going on in the scene. 
you, you don't let them tell them what's going on uh, emotionally with this character um, and what they're trying to accomplish. You know, once they know what they're trying to accomplish with that line, why they're saying that line. That's what I tell my students all the time. Focus on why, not how. Why are you saying this line? Not how to say the line. How to say the line will get you no, nowhere. But why you're saying it will get you everywhere. Because why is like, um, all right, say to me right now, I'm going to the store. I'm going to the store. Now, when you say I'm going to the store to me, this time I want you to kill me with your words. Kill. Like be mean? I just want you to, I just want you to think kill. Okay. I'm going to the store. Oh, sorry. Auto automatically, in your own way, at the very end, but automatically you're emotionally invested because you just know why you're saying it, right? Yeah. Trying to hurt, you know, and, and that, that, that generally gets somebody there. Usually I can get them there with one word. I'll say, okay, you know what? Teach that person with that line or, or reach them or try to hold them. Or stop them with that line. You know that that's usually enough to get them there. If that's not enough, then I, at the very last resort, I will give somebody a line read. And sometimes you have to, like maybe the actor's just too tired or whatever, or or they just they just don't really get this character yet. You know, and if they're really good after a line read, then they can pick up. Oh, I see what he's wanting out of this character. You know, you're a good teacher when you like tell me like okay, that's pretty cool. Probably that's like. Thing. That's my favorite job is teaching, um, and I, I'm so glad I got back into it again. It was about three and a half years ago. Um, I started teaching uh, voice acting uh, out of uh, it was a, a dance studio. I was just renting out a hall, and I got an engineer, uh, my friend Neil, who I'd known actually years before Funimation, but he um, he would set up a recording stand. He's an he's like one of the head engineers of Funimation, and so they would they would record. And then he would actually make demos out of their recordings that we did in class. But um, it was a really good, but once I did that, I was like, oh yeah, I'm, I remember how much I missed teaching. And I told you, originally I wanted to be a professor. I wanted to teach yeah. theater. Um, this is much better, I, I have to say, than actually working for a college, even though I would have, I've given up a lot of benefits and things like that. Um, being able to teach on my own terms and without anyone's curriculum but my own is so much better than to go by what what the standards are from each university or whatever. Plus, I know what I'm talking about. If, if you were a voice actor, what would your career be? If I wasn't a voice actor? Uh, I don't know, because, you know, I so much of my career finances come from comic books. So, you know, I probably would do more comic books. I would probably focus more on that if I wasn't a, vo a voice actor. Um, <clears throat> But um, these days, it's kind of 50-50. Actually, probably, that's, that's probably, I probably do more comic book work than anything. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, I'm currently drawing uh, Elf Quest for uh, Dark Horse Comics. Oh, nice. Okay. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've, I've been self-published, and I actually was published by Tokyo Pop for a while. Um, nice. It's, I, I think that if I hadn't gone into voice acting, I would have a lot more books under my belt, but I've, you know, I've been published quite a few times, at least 20 times, so. Nice. Is there any other interesting hobbies besides, you know, comic booking and all that? I, I, I have to say that probably would be doing something creative, you know. It just, I, I just built that way. You know, yeah. when it comes to anything logical, I'm not very good. Although, I was pretty good at accounting, you know. When I, I used to work for a, a, a hotel chain, and I did auditing for them. Um, so, and my mother was a, a uh, an accountant. Yeah, she is a certified public accountant. Um, so, I just don't think I would have been as jazzed about my life if that was what I had to do every day. You know, mm -hmm. I liked it. I like because when things don't balance, it's kind of like a mystery, and you got to figure out why it doesn't balance. But other than that, I don't know. Teaching, I probably would have been a teacher. I can see that though. Teaching, I don't know why I can see you being a teacher. <laughs> I play a lot of teachers too, so it's funny. It's also funny is that the week I started recording Koro Sensei, I was mm -hmm. also started teaching at my own studio. Oh my gosh, that's kind of right. It was weird, and it was also like some of the things he would say in recording. I was like, oh my god, I just said that in class last week. You know, that's ironic. To be honest. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. Okay, uh, like imitating art and vice versa. 
Nice. Do you have a favorite type of music and band? I, I like all kinds of music. Uh, if it's good, I like it. I, any genre. I, if you look at my um, Pandora playlist, it's all over the map. You know, I mean, I've got a Gorilla Station. I've got a Van Halen Station. I've got classical music stations. Um, I've got hip hop stations. Although I'm more West Coast hip hop, um, definitely of the Dre school. Uh, what else do I like? Uh, yeah, and when, I, I love music scores, like to movies and stuff like that, especially when I'm drawing. I'll, fi I'll find music that suits the drawing I'm doing, so I have a soundtrack while I'm drawing. Yeah, believe it or not, I, my, my favorite band is actually the band we mentioned earlier. You know, Alice? Queen. Oh, Queen, yeah, I love Queen. I actually met them, two of their members. Oh, you did? Who'd you meet? I met Brian and Roger. Whoa, where'd you meet them? <laughs> It was like like 2017 is on my brother's birthday, and we went to the concert. And like after the concert, I feel like you're Brian May. Why did they come in? I was like so like freaking out. You know I mean? Their music is so incredible. I love their music. It's my favorite band right there. Favorite yeah. Band. Can anybody find me? Nice. Do you have a favorite sport and favorite team from those sports? Or? I'm gonna say hockey. No, but it's not true. <laughs> I'm just saying hockey because I know you like hockey. Uh, I'm not really much into sports, um, although I guess I do like hockey, but I, I just don't keep track of it. You know, mm -hmm. I like baseball too as a sport, um, but I, I only like baseball when I'm there. You know, like I yeah. went to a few Ranger games, and I love being at the ballpark. I love the experience of it. I love uh, you know, but watching it on TV just bores me to tears. You know, uh, Thank you. <laughs> even. And, as, and football, too, which football is a little bit more exciting on television, but it still bores me, you know. Um, although I've been to a few football games, I'm always excited at a football game. I guess, you know, to me, sports should be live. You know, it's it's just yeah. it's just not the same. It's like theater because I've done a lot of plays. Right. And when mm -hmm. you're in a theater and you're watching a live performance, it's amazing. But watching a recording of theater is the most boring thing ever. There are just certain things that should be live, and that's sports and theater to me. Okay. Yeah, I love hockey. When you mentioned, like, I'm sorry, but that's my favorite sport right there. <laughs> I figured it had to be because of your email. Yeah, the logo. <laughs> yeah. And my, yeah, my email. Yeah, I love yeah. it. It's my, it's like, it's my, it's my opinion the best. Now, are you so. in <laughs> Canada or are you in Chicago? I'm a big Canucks fan. There's a reason why, though. I'm a Canucks fan. Well, you're almost in Canada. Do you know the reason? Why? Okay, so when I was two years old, I got my first ever hockey stick from their captain at the time. Oh. Made me hockey. So, what's a good so you're, reason? you're blessed by the hockey gods. Yeah. <laughs> I love hockey. Yeah. That's cool. Hopefully when things get back to normal, sooner rather than later, are there any projects you have in the works? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm working on a super secret project right now with Sean Schimmel. Um, oh, nice. Mm -hmm. um, and we're doing, we got finally got back into acting with uh, Funimation, so uh, there's some stuff coming up for that. Um, I don't even know if I can announce it. Yeah, I can't announce that, but it's something that we, what? Top secret. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's something for Funimation as well as top secret. Um, I'm still working on Elf Quest, and last I heard, they they may be the next. The, everything has been on hold. But it looks like the next issue that we've already done will come out in October. So right. we'll be back on track in October. That's good to hear. Here. Yeah. So, um, and I'm, I'm teaching again. I'm teaching. I'm, instead of now teaching in person, I'm teaching online. But I'm teaching once a month instead of every other month. I was teaching every other month 20 people. Now I'm teaching 10 people every month. So that's the only minor change. But it's a lot. It's a lot different uh, class uh, online. Like I said before, it's it's a bit more of an intimate experience because the, they feel more free to express themselves. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. Though. Like maybe when you said the top secret thing, I feel like top secret like on the screen. <laughs> yeah, you need to. Mm, I had the whole thing explode at the end. <laughs> You're not even allowed to remember that this was saying. It's like the you know the men in black thing how the how they have like those wipers like get races from them. Yeah, exactly. Just hold that up. Mm -hmm. That'd be funny. Okay. Yeah. 
As a matter of fact, here, dude, you, you can superimpose it on this. <laughs> and like a big flash at the end. I'm sorry, that's funny. That's really funny. Okay. Is there any advice you'd give to younger people who want to become a voice actor, comic book artist? Any advice you give? Yeah, um, don't expect things to happen overnight. You know, mm -hmm. it's to succeed in anything, it takes a good 10 years at least to, uh, to get your footing in. Um, like I said, I was acting for 14 years on stage before I auditioned for Funimation. So, mm -hmm. but it was the first uh, cartoon I'd ever uh, auditioned for. It seemed like an instant success, right? An overnight success story. But the, you don't see the 14 years that led up to that that allowed me to get the part because I had the training to go and I went into it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I started, I didn't take cartooning seriously until I was 22. Wow. So it took a long time for that to, to get uh, some traction too. Um, but I think if you're patient, then, you know, you're, and you keep improving, then you should just keep doing it. Um, mm -hmm. You have to measure success by your own progress. You can't measure it by people around you either. A lot of people do that as well. But I always tell my students that art is not a competition. If it was a competition, by now we'd have a winner. Who's yeah. the winner of art? Who is the best artist ever? Was it Michelangelo, Leonardo, Donatello? Raphael. Now, <laughs> here's the thing. I like Dali, and he's not a Ninja Turtle, so mm -hmm. it could be. It's 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 up to taste at that point, right? Mm -hmm. You cannot you cannot compete. Um, Joe, if you express yourself in an art, even if you just draw stick figures, right? Yeah. You're still expressing yourself, and no one can express Joe better than Joe. Yeah. So that's my best advice: is to compete against yourself. As long, and I told myself years ago when I started drawing comics that I'll stop when I stop getting better. Mm. And I have yet to stop getting better. I've never been that happy with anything I've done, but I'm, I usually, I'm usually happier in retrospect. Like if I come back to it a few years later and I go, oh yeah, that's actually pretty good. Mm. But I'm always, I'm hypercritical while I'm doing it. That's another thing. You, at the same time, be very critical of yourself. Yeah. Don't let yourself get away with anything. Don't just say, oh, it's good enough. I'm putting this out there. Um, I'm, one of my students was auditioning for something. And um, I, one of the things I teach my students is about how to find their motivations. You know, And I said, so what did you do to find your motivations on these lines, like, on these recordings? And he goes, well, I didn't do that. And I went, well, it shows. You know? <laughs> and he's like, he said, well, but I wanted to get it out there. And I said, you need, if you want to get it out there, but you've got to get it out there right. You know, make sure it, it sounds your best. Make sure that whatever you put out there is your very best. And mm -hmm. don't, I know people get so excited, they just think, I, I gotta get this out there and stuff. But the goal is not getting the role. The mm -hmm. goal should be the experience of doing it. You know, uh, don't look at an audition as, as, some, as, a, as a goal in itself. Look at an audition as a chance to express yourself in another form. You know, mm -hmm. in, you're not, you, your chances of getting a part when you audition are very low. That's why mm -hmm. most actors consider themselves professional auditioners. Um, even when I was auditioning at Funimation, I, don't, I haven't auditioned at Funimation in a while. Oh, that's not true. I did one little thing recently. But generally, for a while there, I was doing like two or three times a month I was auditioning for something. And I would get a lead role maybe once or twice a year. And that's me. You know, I had a lot of experience. But it... but. I know from being a director, it doesn't matter so, how talented somebody is. It's it, There's so many other factors that go into it. Like, mm -hmm. okay, your voice sounds great, but it doesn't sound good next to this voice that I've already cast, you know? Mm -hmm. Or this person just sounds more like that person, you know? With Funimation, we have over 600 people in our stable now. Mm -hmm. So we can afford to typecast everything. You know, we, if there's a role on there, we could probably find somebody who's perfectly suited for it. And like some of the most talented people, like, I think Monica Rial is probably the most talented actor I've ever worked with. And yet I've turned her down twice in auditions mm -hmm. because it was just somebody else's voice was better suited for that character for what I wanted to do with it. Right. Mm -hmm. I've also cast her in about every other show as well because she is that talented. 
But I'm, I, but it's, it seems ridiculous to say I wouldn't give Monica Rial a part because she is the best actor I've ever worked with. But mm-hmm. you're not always the right person for that director for that role. So what I tell my students when they finally get their first audition, and many of them have, I see people at Funimation all the time that were my students, which is amazing. You know, that's, I always go, that's one of mine, that's one of mine, that's one of mine. But I tell them, on your first audition, don't, don't let it kill you if you don't get a part. You know, mm-hmm. because it doesn't mean anything. It does not mean you suck. I mean, you could suck, but it doesn't mean you suck. No, nobody sucks. What it means is, for whatever reason, the director wanted somebody else. That's all it means. And yeah. you've got to have that tough skin. Like I told you, I, have, I was auditioning two or three times a month and getting two or three roles a year. So that means most of the things I auditioned for, I was not going to get. I knew going in, I probably would not get this role. Mm-hmm. You know, And you have to have that attitude. I'm not here to do that. I'm here to just uh, test myself out, You know, trying mm-hmm. myself out in a different format. I'm acting in a different way than I had before because I'm acting as an audition. Yeah. yeah. I, like, I like that advice. Oh my God. <laughs> is there anything you like to promote or shout out to the viewers? Uh, if you haven't checked out Elf Quest at Dark Horse, you should check it out. It's a series, and you can read the whole series online uh, from 1979 on. That's um, uh, at ElfQuest.com for free, um, except for the latest books that were published at Dark Horse. Elf Quest is a great series. It started out as a self-published book, and being a self-publisher, I you know gravitated to it right away. But it's also been published by Marvel, DC, and Dark Horse, and they still own the rights to their book. That's unheard of in, our, in the comic book industry. I don't know if you guys know anything about comics, but that no one's been published by everybody and still keep the rights to their books. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it's a it's a really cool emotionally driven series, um, and I remember reading it when I was uh, in high school, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so it was it was just a, a thrill to be you know a fan of this series and then get to draw it years later. And not only that, the woman who created it became my sensei, and I worked in her studio for a year, and I learned more in that year than I did like ten years by myself. Uh, so ElfQuest, um, you know, of course, go to Funimation, and that's about all I can talk about right now. I don't know. Do you have a Twitter or an Instagram? I click, please. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter, uh, Sunny Straight, and. Um, Instagram, I think Sunny Straight on Instagram too. Yeah, and uh, of course I'm on Facebook as well. You can follow me there. I, I it's my personal Facebook. It's not a fan page, um, so it's five thousand friends. It's maxed out almost all the time, uh-huh. but I do have followers as well on there. Probably an additional four thousand followers as well. But what I do, I can't, you know, because Facebook people come in and out all the time, mm-hmm. so I'll look on there occasionally see who's put in a friend's request and then, and accept that. But usually it's packed. Wow. So do you, I'll link to your Twitter and Instagram. Yeah. Want. If you want to, absolutely. Yeah. Hope you yeah. Well, thank you all so much for watching. Thank you again for being a great guest, Mr. Craig. Thanks for having me. I had a great time. Thank you. This was a fun and awesome time with the men in the black thing when I was gone. <laughs> <laughs> what do you go back to hear that? Yeah. Well, thank you all so much again. Stay awesome, everybody, and stay awesome, Mr. Straight. Stay awesome, guys. And for about 10 years, I focused on just drawing comics. Hello. Oh, sorry. That's no problem. And, um, and I've gotten, like, sorry. several different... Let me go get the phone. Sorry. Yeah, okay, go ahead. This part will be edited out, I'm cool. sure. Those of you watching at home, don't expect to see this as part of the reel. Maybe part of like the, the uh, outtake reel or something like that, where the phone okay. rings. Sorry okay. about that. <laughs> she, she, my brother, he's like a, also a big fan of you. He's at the doctor. Sorry about uh, that. Oh, so, no problem. Okay, you're uh, saying you could go back. So I gave you something for your blooper reel while you're answering the phone. Oh, okay. uh, thank you. <laughs> you'll see it later. Um, you want to take a little water break? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Why don't you be like a little refreshed? <laughs> that was good. All right. Yeah, that was good.